or it reached the treasury. It's an engineering feat almost as impressive as the treasury itself. They realized that if they divert the water, they allow the water to spread out to a much a bigger surface, and this reduced its speed tremendously. It worked perfectly. So perfectly, Bellwald can't improve on this design. Today, a team is repairing this ancient dam network so it can once again protect the treasury. If we want to keep the treasury for the future, we have to protect it again as 2,000 years before from flash floods, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Because the threat of floods was so great, Bellwald believes the Nabataeans must have built the dam system and the treasury at the same time. In fact, scholars now believe the grand tombs, the city center, and the water systems, most of the ancient city of Petra, were built within a hundred years around the birth of Jesus. The entire hydraulic infrastructure of Petra was built following one master plan. So just how much water did that system provide? Back in San Jose, Charles Ortloff is figuring that out. These are the main supplies of water from all of the cisterns, all the dams. Ortloff has mapped every water feature he and other archaeologists have discovered. Eight springs for fresh drinking water, 36 dams to protect the city from flash floods, over 100 cisterns and reservoirs to collect and hold rainwater, and 125 miles of pipeline to connect many of these features into one integrated water system. From the map and his flume experiments, Ortloff can estimate the total amount of water available to Petra's 30,000 people. If you sum up all of the water from various sources, that would lead to eight liters per person per day. Eight liters is about two gallons. In a world before showers and washing machines, that's more than enough water to survive on. In fact, new discoveries revealed that the Nabataeans had enough water to transform Petra into a desert oasis. Evidence of that water surplus is being found right next to the Great Temple, in a large open terrace. It was named by early explorers as the marketplace. So when Leanne Bedal began digging here in 1998, that's what she expected. Because it had been called a marketplace, I came in prepared to excavate a market. But as she began digging, at eight feet deep, she discovered waterproof cement. So we knew that we had something containing water or something deep. Her team excavated further and discovered a subterranean structure. We have the southwest corner here, and directly to the north is the northwest corner. Badal located all four corners to discover overall dimensions of 140 by 80 feet, nearly the size of an Olympic swimming pool. Then, in the middle, she found evidence of a stone platform and surrounding the sunken structure, channels, likely used for irrigating a lower terrace, where soil samples suggest the area had been cultivated. When she puzzles the evidence together, Badal concludes the marketplace was, in fact, a huge ornamental pool complex, including an island pavilion and a garden on a terrace below. If you can imagine below us this large pool of water and then a green garden uh, with date palm trees and flowers, this is something that is for showing off. Throughout the city center, archaeologists are finding other decorative water features, like fountains and a canal running beside a colonnaded street. It's really conspicuous consumption of this precious resource, water, in this desert environment. Conspicuous consumption of water in the middle of a desert? It seems Petra resembled another flashy desert destination. The 
great comparison is Las Vegas, where you have this very arid desert surrounding this oasis city, where everywhere you go, you see the use of water fountains. By diverting a precious resource into a wealthy center, it sends a message to anybody who sees it that this is a place of wealth and power. For ancient visitors, after days of traveling on camel through the hot, parched desert, entering this oasis city must have made a powerful impression. Petra's luxurious pools and internationally inspired architecture likely sparked the legends that echoed through the ages. Back in California, after two months of carving and nearly 2,000 years, architecture of far-off lands emerges from the rock. We've got Assyrian, Egyptian, Greco-Roman, but you put it together, you stand back, and it's Nabataean. And now it's a little bit Californian. That's <laughs> Whether the Nabataeans were carving tombs for the dead or water channels for the living, their mastery of stone was the key to Petra's wealth and beauty. So why did the Nabataean kingdom decline and Petra largely disappear? Across the city, collapsed columns point to a prime suspect. Ancient texts record a huge earthquake in 363. As a result, for a while, when archaeologists came to Petra, anytime they saw something like this, they'd say, ah, this fell down in 363. But one catastrophic earthquake does not provide the whole picture of the city's decline. At the Great Pool, the most luxurious place in Petra, there's evidence that hard times hit the city even earlier. It may have been as early as the second century, because at that point we find a lot of animal bones at the bottom of the pool, so it seems to have been used for trash. Found in the Great Pool, this layer of fallen rocks dates to around the 363 quake. But below that, the layer of soil containing the animal bones indicates the pool filled in at least 100 years before. And there is evidence of more destruction 100 years after the Great Quake which may have fatally weakened the city's protective dams. Large sections of Petra's main street are missing pavers. Tom Paradise believes they were washed away in a catastrophic flash flood. The floodwaters rush down through Petra city center, ripping up cobblestones. This flood inundated the city and may have marked the end of Petra's golden age. Ironically, the very water that brought life to Petra may also have contributed to its demise. Today, in the hills of Southern California, the carving team is bringing a bit of Petra back to life. The final flourish will be a feature not found in other cultures, a Nabataean-style capital with a simple knob in its center. Normally, there is a detail here. Typically, there is a leaf or a flower here. You never really see it left in this very abstract form. It's quite beautiful in its simplicity. Paradise believes the Nabataeans choose this simple form out of respect, almost reverence, for the sandstone. Their sense of the rock as a living material that had to be sort of caressed and worked was really as remarkable as their engineering expertise. And the sandstone itself becomes a tool to finish the surface of the tomb using the same stone that we carved off the rock. I'm just rubbing the last little stages, just kind of carefully finishing off that last surface.
stone is at the core of Nabataean lives. The very name for their city, Petra, comes from the Greek word for rock. The Nabataean relationship with their sandstone was fundamental to who they were. They're born in this valley of rock. They live in this valley of rock. And then when they die, they are buried in the rock itself. These hewn tomb facades become their final resting place. Each year, over a half a million tourists retrace the steps of the explorer Johann Ludwig Burkhardt and gaze up in awe at the treasury. But in the two centuries since Petra was reopened to the Western world, its distinctive engineering and culture is proving equal to that of any ancient civilization. Petra's more than a city. It was the seed of a kingdom, a kingdom whose peace and prosperity was the envy of the ancient world. Cisterns, channels, dams, even fountains and pools. The Nabataean mastery of water fueled their astonishing city of stone. The water features are underpinning everything. If the Nabataeans couldn't control this water, you wouldn't have a city here. Over 2,000 years ago, a desert tribe settled among these forbidding cliffs and transformed this hostile landscape into an oasis. The Nabataeans learned how to maximize these limited resources to produce a society and a culture that thrived and prospered for hundreds and hundreds of years. Burkhardt came here chasing legends of a city lost in the sands of the desert, a city with riches from all over the known world, buildings that rivaled Egypt and Rome, and fountains and pools overflowing with water. Today, it's clear many of the legendary splendors of the lost city of Petra are true. The story continues 